Well, good morning, Walden Church. Today we are going to be in Matthew chapter 16. And for me, this is one of the most important chapters in all of Matthew. And if you're just joining us, uh, we've been in Matthew for the past couple weeks, and we are on our way to Easter. So I'm trying to navigate this book as best we can to give you the highlights as we make our way to the cross, to the resurrection. And so, of course, we'll be skipping a couple chapters, but you just can't skip chapter 16. This is, I think this is the high point of Jesus' teaching, and it's the pinnacle of the disciples and how they grow and their spiritual understanding. And so I think it's crucial to what we've even been talking about these past couple weeks. We've talked about being a follower, and we've talked about Jesus' authority, and we saw how he gave that authority to his disciples. And then, uh, just in this last chapter, Matthew uncovered who Jesus was. Matthew 16 starts off, And the Pharisees and Sadducees came, and to test him, they asked him to show them a sign from heaven. He answered them, When it is evening, you say, it'll be a fair weather, for the sky is red. And in the morning, it'll be a stormy day, for the sky is red and threatening. You know how to interpret the appearance of the sky, but you cannot interpret the signs of the times. An evil and adulterous generation seeks for a sign, but no sign will be given to it except the sign of Jonah. So he left them and departed. When the disciples reached the other side, they had forgotten to bring any bread. And Jesus said to them, Watch and beware of the leaven of the Pharisees and Sadducees. And they began discussing it among themselves, saying, We brought no bread. But Jesus, aware of this, said, O you of little faith, why are you discussing among yourselves the fact that you have no bread? Do you not perceive? Do you not yet remember the five thousand, and they were fed with loaves, and how many baskets you had gathered? Or the seven loaves and the four thousand, and how many baskets you gathered? How is it that you fail to understand that I did not speak about bread? Beware of the leaven of the Pharisees and the Sadducees. Then they understood that he did not tell them to beware of the leaven of the bread, but of the teaching of the Pharisees and Sadducees. Jesus is leaving uh, a more heavily Roman-occupied city, and he's heading closer to a more Jewish area of living. And he gets into a town, and he's met by the official delegation, the Pharisees and the Sadducees. And I know that you and I, we talk about them, we lump them together, uh, but they would not appreciate that because they were two very different groups. I mean, first, they believed two totally different things, and they often clashed with each other. But there is something about having a common enemy that brings groups together. The Pharisees, they were strict observers of the law. They were legalists. They were ultra-conservative. In fact, the traditions that they made sometimes took more precedent than the Bible. This group was trying to earn righteousness. So they were self-righteous, classic legalists. And this came about from their stories of the Old Testament. You know, they saw how the Jews didn't obey and how that made God angry, how the Jews fell out of favor with God. And so their goal was, we're going to do everything we possibly can not to make God angry again. So we're going to do good, we're going to be good, and we're going to earn God's favor. The Sadducees were also ultra-conservative, but they had money. And this was a much smaller group because they were made up of a wealthy class. They knew it was better to have Rome closer to them than to treat them as an enemy. So they had no trouble scratching Rome's back. And as such, they were a more self-indulgent group. They didn't believe in heaven or hell or angels or demons or even life after death. So why not live it up and enjoy life while you're here? I mean, if you're rich, it obviously meant God was blessing you with his good graces. And if you were poor, maybe that meant that you were a sinner and God was punishing you. And I know we always make them out to be the villains in our Bible stories, but we can't negate these two groups because you and I, we fall into these two traps all the time. And sometimes in our faith, we can be very by the book, you know, and, and say that there's absolutely no room for grace. God has no gray area. If the Bible said it, I believe it. 
But there's other times where we let our emotions get in the way or greed get in the way of our faith. And even though God's word speaks against it, or we know it's not something God wants us to do, we do it anyway because it feels good or because everybody else is doing it. And now we have both of these groups approaching Jesus. The disciples know who Jesus is, but these two groups, they still don't. So they've come to discover their own answer to this riddle. Who is Jesus? So they say, who are you? Do a sign for us right now. Hey, oh, you do magic tricks? Can you do a trick for us? And Jesus says, huh, how about this weather we're having? <laughs> Way to change the subject. Jesus says, you know, y'all can look up at the sky and you know whether it's going to rain or not, but you can't look at the spiritual world and understand what's happening all around you. They should have known, right? They should have known all the Bible stories forwards and backwards. They should have known all the signs of the coming Messiah more than anyone else, right? They should be able to answer the question, who is Jesus? But here we are. And the most supposed holiest people on the planet are missing out on this epic story that God is telling. So we have this irony. The disciples, who are followers, they are in. We just had a confession of faith from them last week. And then we catch up to the religious leaders. They're the elite. And these poor guys, they're stuck. They can't figure who Jesus is. Give us a sign, Jesus. And Jesus says, no sign for you. Actually, he says, the only sign that you'll get is the sign of Jonah. What's that all about? Well, Jonah was trapped inside the belly of a great fish for three days. And then after three days, he was reborn on dry land. And Jesus tells them, the sign you'll get is my death and my resurrection. That'll be my greatest magic trick ever. Y'all will condemn me to death. You'll watch me die. You'll bury me beneath the earth for three days. And then I'll be out. I'll be out walking around again. But even that won't be good enough for them. And in truth, it's not even good enough for an atheist or a non-believer today. You ever had the discussion with an agnostic or an atheist and they said, you know, if I could just have proof, if I could have proof that it worked, proof that this was all real, then I would believe. I'd like to believe that. But it's not true. Some ground is just hard soil, Jesus says. In fact, Jesus said, if they do not hear Moses and the prophets, neither will they be convinced if someone should rise from the dead. You know, there's a famous line in the movie Cool Hand Luke. Some men you just can't reach. Creation. Creation is proof that God exists. Even scientists can see the proof of intelligent design. Your own human body is proof God exists, both in physiology and in your moral center. Human beings are born with a sense of right and wrong. A moral law is proof of a moral law giver. Jesus was proof. One man who lived 2,000 years ago is still on the cover of magazines today, still has a following today. And when he walked the earth, eyewitnesses saw him die and eyewitnesses saw him alive three days later. The proof of God is all around us. Show me a sign, Lord, and then I'll believe in you. Now, the reason for unbelief is self-righteousness and indulgence. The Pharisees and Sadducees were closed off to the idea, so they would never believe, no matter the evidence, even if someone were to rise from the dead. People don't like to be told what to do. People don't like to be told what to believe. And today, people oppose the message of Jesus because they want to do what they want to do. They don't want to submit to God's authority. They want to be the authority themselves. And it's, it's mutiny, really. That's what it is. It's rebellion. And that's what sin is. It's rebellion. Then Jesus makes a comment as the religious leaders walk away to his disciples. And the disciples say, oh, Jesus is mad because we don't have bread. <laughs> 
And the reaction from Jesus is the same reaction any parent or any teacher would have. How many times do I have to say this? How is it that you still don't understand? You know, if I said it once, I've said it a thousand times. Why would this be about bread? I mean, think about it. Do you, do you think I have a problem making bread? Do you guys not remember 12 baskets? And I can read this story and I can shake my head at the disciples and I can criticize them for being thick headed. But then I remember I'm not any better, right? I'm not any better than this. How often do I forget God's blessing? How often do I forget that God comes through for me? How often do I forget my place in all of this? And so next up, here comes one of the most famous passages in all of the Bible. A top 10 famous quote from Jesus, foundational in your faith. You know, we talk sometimes about how we don't know the Bible as well as we should, or perhaps there should be verses that we memorize. You should have these memorized. Or at least you should know where to find these verses. Matthew 16, verses 13 through 20. Now when Jesus came to the district of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples, Who do people say the Son of Man is? And they said, Some say John the Baptist, others say Elijah, and others Jeremiah or one of the prophets. And he said to them, But who do you say that I am? Simon Peter replied, You are the Christ, the Son of the living God. And Jesus answered him, Blessed are you, Simon Barjona, for flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my Father who is in heaven. And I tell you, you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven, and whatever you bind on earth shall be bound in heaven, and whatever you loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. And then he strictly charged the disciples to tell no one what, that he was the Christ. You know, this is the first place that we see and hear the word church. First, you know, the first, the question was, who is Jesus? And then now we have this new word, the church. So who is the church? Well, in the Greek, the church, that word means, ekles is the word ekklesia. And it means the assembly or the called out ones. But who are these called out ones? Well, quite simply, they're the ones who can answer the question correctly. Who is Jesus? The church knows the answer to that question. They are the group of people who know Jesus. They are the community. They are the people that know his identity, right? Intimately. What he did, what he said. And Peter was giving the right answer. Right? He says, this is the guy who walked on water. This is the guy who walked on water. So Peter says, I have no doubt. I have no doubt. Peter says, you are the Christ. In other words, you are the Messiah. You are the one we have been waiting for. And Jesus says, ding, 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 ding. Right? You got it right. Matthew started out this chapter by saying that the best and the brightest religious leaders can't figure this guy out. And Peter knows the right answer. How is Peter smarter than the religious leaders? Jesus tells us. He says, this knowledge that you have is a gift from God. That's the only way any one of us can get it. Jesus says, for flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my Father who is in heaven. Why do some people get it? Jesus says in John 6, no one comes to me unless the Father who sent me draws him, and I will raise him up on the last day. I mean, look around you. Even, even this church, whether your church at home is full or empty, has many members or few members. Why are any of them there? It's because God drew them. God revealed to them. God opened the eyes of the blind. The church is a place of people who all get it, not because of their own doing or their own smartness or their own goodness. Why am I here? Because God drew me. Why was I picked? Because God drew me. Why do I get it? God. The answer is God. God is the answer to all of those questions. He's the only answer. Remember, there were thousands, right? 
Thousands of people who saw Jesus and listened to him teach. Thousands of people who saw his miracles because he was a real person. But when that church, when that first church began in the upper room in the book of Acts, how many people were in that room? I guarantee you there wasn't even a hundred. The church is a group of people who all collectively say, he is the Christ, he is God's very own son. The church is identified by what they believe and how they obey and who they follow. What does the church believe? Verse 16, Simon Peter says, you are the Christ, the son of the living God. That is his belief, right? That's important. The disciples believe there is something there, even before they had the whole picture. That's why they immediately dropped their nets and followed. They, they had a belief before anything else. They said something is there. And now we're 16 chapters in, and now they believe Jesus is God. And Jesus asked them, I already know what the world believes. I know what the world believes. I want to know what you believe. So the church begins with a statement of belief. It begins with doctrine. It begins with theology. Because if you only believe that Jesus was a man or that he was a good teacher or that he was a moral teacher or a guru or that he lived and died and his body is now rotting somewhere, then you are not a follower. And you are not part of his church. Do you believe in Jesus? Maybe you prayed a prayer. Maybe you read some Bible verses. But do you believe in him? The church believes and the church obeys. Jesus says, you are Peter and on this rock I will build my church. What is the rock? This one verse has tripped up a lot of people. <laughs> but as obedient Christians, our first job is to grow his kingdom, right? Build his church. So if it would help you understand what rock means, yes, Jesus is speaking once again in parable. But what I want you to know is that whatever you believe about the word rock is right. It's true. You are right. Let me prove it to you. Uh, Jesus is the rock, right? Jesus is the rock. 1 Corinthians 3 says, For no one can lay a foundation other than what was laid, which is Jesus Christ. A little later in 1 Corinthians, And all drank the same spiritual drink, for they drank from the spiritual rock, that followed them, and the rock was Christ. No doubt about it. No doubt about it. And when we get to Matthew 21, Jesus describes himself as the chief cornerstone. And if Jesus is the rock, then he is the stability. If he is the truth, then it's his church, right? It's his church, and we should be building our church obediently on him. He is the rock, of course. But there's a second rock, <laughs> and it's where they are standing. Matthew 16 says, uh, in verse 13, they came to the district of Caesarea Philippi, and he asked his disciples, who do the people say the Son of Man is? Caesarea Philippi is Caesar Philip, right? Philip Caesar. So this is a lush area near the foot of Mount Hermon, and it was the religious center to the Greek god Pan. The Greeks named the city Panias first in his honor. Years later, when the Romans conquered the territory, uh, Herod Philip rebuilt the city and named it after himself. But Caesarea Philippi continued to worship those Greek gods. The pagans of Jesus' day believed that their fertility gods lived in the underworld during the winter, and then they returned to the earth every spring. They saw water as a symbol of the underworld and thought their gods traveled to their world through caves. Well, up on the cliff above this city, local people built a shrine and they built some temples at the mouth of a cave that looks like an entrance into hell. It's there the people believed the fertility gods lived during the winter. And so during droughts or seasons of low food, the people would commit detestable acts on that mountain to their gods. And so this cave that stands above Caesarea Philippi 
became a gate to the underworld. The people literally believed it was the gates of hell. So when Jesus brings his nice, well-raised, obedient, devout Jews to this area, they would have been shocked. Caesarea Philippi was like the red light district of their world, and devout Jews would have avoided this area at all costs. But Jesus presents a very clear promise, standing, looking out over Caesarea Philippi about how we obey. Right? He doesn't want his followers hiding from evil. Instead, he wants them to storm the gates of hell. Peter makes a proclamation of faith, and Jesus says, that's the right answer. And if you obey me, he says, there's nothing that can stop you. So Jesus is a rock, and they are standing on a rock. And Peter is also called the rock, right? Ephesians 2.20 says that we are built on the foundation of the apostles and the prophets. Christ Jesus himself being the cornerstone. So Peter's name actually means rock. But does that mean that Jesus says, on this Peter, I will build my church? Well, there has to be some parallel, right? There has to be some relationship between Peter's name being rock and then his answer. But it has more to do with what the rock says than Peter himself. Remember, this, this rock can speak right? Peter can speak. So what does Peter say? He says the words of gospel. He says kingdom language. Jesus asks a question. Peter gives the right answer. And then Jesus says, yes. And based on this right belief, upon this proclamation of the gospel, upon this foundational truth, I will build my church. Ephesians says, yes. We are the foundation. It's the apostles, it's the prophets. It's the believers. Yes, Jesus is a cornerstone. It all rests on his shoulders. But you are also part of it. And Peter is also part of it. And now it's our turn to obey. It was Peter's turn, now it's our turn. It's our turn to follow. It's our turn to proclaim this message that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God. The church father Origen said, If we too have said like Peter, thou art the Christ, the son of the living God, not as if flesh and blood had revealed it to us, but by light from the Father in heaven, having shown in our heart, we become a Peter. For a rock is a very disciple of Christ, and upon every such rock is built every word of the church. All bear the surname of rock, who are the imitators of Christ. We are called Christians, right? Because we believe in Christ. We would also be called rocks because Jesus is the rock of our salvation. And that's exactly how many early church members saw Peter's faith. So we are the church through what we believe, how we obey, and who we follow. Jesus nicknamed Peter rock, just as followers of Christ are nicknamed Christian. The disciples had followed Jesus all the way, literally now to the gates of hell. And and now going forward, every step they take leads them closer to the cross. It's funny how Christians get scared or worried or fearful of the outside world. We worry that the world is going to silence the voice of God or diminish Jesus' authority in some way. And Jesus said himself, don't worry. Nothing will stop this message Jesus said. In fact, death didn't even stop Jesus. And do you know what? Death will not stop his church. You see, our job is to follow, not to question the direction. And even though Jesus might take us to some scary places, we don't need to fear because we go with the one who has authority over all things. And in this passage, Jesus then gives the authority to the church. Previously, he had given it to the disciples. Now he's giving that same authority to the church. He says in verse 19, I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven, and whatever you bind on earth shall be bound in heaven, and whatever you loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. That means from now until Jesus returns, when we proclaim the gospel, we do so under Jesus' authority the same authority he first gave the disciples through his Holy Spirit. 
That Holy Spirit has now been given to you. The church, this church, any church, is not a social club. It's not a place to go and see your friends. It's a living organism. It is Jesus Christ himself, and he loves it, and he built it, and he died for it. Have you ever heard somebody say, yeah, I like, I like that church because, you know, they have a pastor who preaches the gospel. Guess what? That church is not about the pastor. Have you ever heard someone say, oh, I like that church because they have amazing worship. They have an amazing worship team. They have a great worship band. I love their choir. Guess what? It's not about the music or the type of music or the organ or the fact that there's a drum set or a choir. Have you ever heard someone say, you know, that church, they've got a really strict governing council. They, have, they are super strict deacons. They have a very tight budget. They have a very clicky leadership. Guess what? Church is not about that either. And it's not even about you. And it's not even about me. So many of the problems of the church is rooted in the false belief that the church somehow belongs to me. And I speak about my church and my ministry as if somehow I am the owner. We build our little kingdom within our little framework of the church, and we dare anyone to cross our boundaries. We say, oh, I, I work in the kitchen, right? I work in the kitchen, so everybody else stay out. If I teach a Sunday school class, and somebody comes through and cleans or organizes or paints my room a different color, I freak out. And I sit in my pew, and I want to sing my favorite songs, and I want to hear my favorite sermon. The point is, none of that petty junk would matter if we truly believed that the church belongs to Jesus Christ and he builds it. He builds it as he sees fit. Church is about the one we follow. He is the bedrock. He is the cornerstone. He is the truth. He is the light. That first profession of faith that came out of the mouths of Peter, you are the Christ, the son of the living God. I want to close our time with a passage from the book of Hebrews. Hebrews 10, verse 19 says, Therefore, brothers, since we have confidence to enter the holy places by the blood of Jesus, by the new and living way that he opened for us through the curtain, that is, through his flesh, and since we have a great priest over the house of God, let us draw near with a true heart in full assurance of faith that our hearts sprinkled clean from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water, let us hold fast the confession of our hope without wavering, for he who promised is faithful. And let us consider how to stir up one another to love and good works, not neglecting to meet together as, the, as some are in the habit of doing, but encouraging one another and all the more as you see the day drawing near. The author of Hebrews begins by saying, you know, it's no longer about Pharisees and Sadducees. Now we have a new high priest. And then they write, let us hold fast. To what? The confession. What confession? Jesus is the Christ. He is the Son of God. And he says, we do so, right? We do so without wavering. And then they write, build the church. No, it doesn't. Yes, it does. Well, what does it say? It says, hold fast to the confession, which means what? That's what the church believes right? Don't shake, don't falter, don't backpedal, don't waver, hold fast. And then it says, stir up one another with love and good works, which means that's how the church obeys. How many of the Jesus, how many of Jesus instructions were about love and who to love and how to love and how to forgive and how to show grace and how to protect, to care for widows and orphans. And then what does it say? not neglecting to meet together as some are in the habit of doing, but encouraging one another as you see the day drawing near. There's a joke that uh, three pastors get together for coffee and all three of them discovered uh, that their churches were all infested by bats. I got so mad, said one, that I got a shotgun and I fired at them and it made holes in the church ceiling, but it did nothing to the bats. I tried trapping them alive, 
said the second pastor, and then I drove 50 miles, and then I released them. But you know what? The bats flew all the way back to the church, and they beat me home. I haven't had any more problems, said the pastor of the third church. What did you do? The others asked, very amazed. I just baptized them, he said, and I haven't seen them since. Who does the church follow? Jesus. And what does Jesus say he's going to do? I will build my church. Well, then I guess we better grab a hammer. In fact, every Christian should be a church member. Why? Because there's no place for a true Christian outside of the church. Ephesians 2.19 says you are a member of God's very own family and you belong in God's household with every other Christian. No argument. Where do you belong? With every other Christian. Jesus is in the business of building his church. That needs to be our business too. And we do it together. And it's not a Sunday only thing. Jesus isn't just building his church on Sunday. And he isn't just building his church when it's convenient. Can I give you a couple of things? Let me give you a couple of things really quick, okay? First, we can do it by living holy. We live a holy life. First Peter says, just as he who called you is holy, so you be holy in all that you do. For it is written, be holy because I am holy. George Gallup said, we find there is very little difference in ethical behavior between churchgoers and those who are not active religiously. The levels of lying, cheating, and stealing are remarkable similar in both groups. Eight out of 10 Americans consider themselves Christians, Gallup said. Yet only half of them could identify the person who gave the Sermon on the Mount, and fewer still could recall five of the Ten Commandments. Only two in ten said they would be willing to suffer for their faith. Being part of the church, the body of Christ, means that we are different. Remember, we are the ecclesia. We are the called out ones. And if we truly believe different, then we should live different. We should live hungry. We should live a hungry life. Matthew 5, 6 says, Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they will be filled. What are you hungry for? You kind of live for your passions, right? You live for those things that excite you. And we can be hungry for anything, we, but we need to be careful about what we consume. We should only be consuming things that satisfy, and that's Jesus. We have to develop an appetite for the things of God. We should be hungry and thirsty for God and for his church. Third, I would say live helpful. Live helpful. Romans 8, 28 says, we know that for those who love God, all things work together for good, for those who are called according to his purpose. The church should be helpful. We need to be serving ministers, the hands and feet of God, and last, live hopeful. Hopeful. Remember, Jesus told Peter, the gates of hell will not overcome it. The world doesn't win. So don't worry. Evil doesn't win. So preach boldly. Believe. Obey. Follow. Build this church. Be the church. Let's pray together. Father God, we thank you for the church, that she is the bride of Christ, and she is beautiful. Lord, may it be the mission of each one to continue to build this church as you instructed. May we continue what those first disciples started in the book of Acts in the upper room. Fill each one here with the words of the Holy Spirit and the authority of your Son that when we go from this place, we preach boldly, that we do great works of service, that we minister, that we show love, that we exercise grace, and that when people see us, when they hear us, they see your Son. We do this for him. Each board, each plank, each light bulb 
It's all for him. Each car out there in the parking lot is there for him. Each member who serves, each member who teaches, each member who gives of their time or their talent or their treasure, we do so for him. Lord, it is your kingdom come, your will be done on this earth as it is in heaven. Give each one here their daily bread and forgive us our sins and help us to forgive those who sin against us. Lead us away from temptation. Deliver us from evil. You are the kingdom. You are the power. And you are the glory forever and ever. Amen. Well, thank you for coming out and worshiping with us today. Uh, we just want to remind you that we are here. We are here in this building every single Sunday, uh, twice on Sunday, one at 9.30. We have a traditional service. We're going to sing all the hymns that you remember, all the hymns that you grew up with. And then in between our services, we have coffee and donuts. We would love to have you stay for that so that we can meet you and get to know you. And then our 11 o'clock service is our contemporary service where we have a worship team. And it's also at that time that we have an adult Sunday school class. So we have an adult Bible study that meets at 11 and it's a smaller, more intimate group. And you are certainly welcome to join in on that. We also have a uh, Bible study class or a Sunday school class for all our age groups from nursery all the way through high school. On every single Wednesday, we also have youth group. And whether you attend our church or not, you are certainly free to send your fifth grade through high school student over to us at six o'clock and we'll keep them for about an hour and a half. We will even feed them dinner before we send them home to you. You can send them over on their bike or their skateboard. We'd love to have them. Thanks and I'll see you guys soon.